channel. My name is Bad Brad, and if you're not familiar with what I do, I'm going to give you a little idea today and a little context. Today, I'm going to be talking about the types of gigs here in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, I've been very lucky to do just about every kind of gig there is for a guitar player here in this town. And you will be very surprised at the different types of gigs. You know, everybody thinks Nashville, and for some reason they think cowboy boots, although we don't wear them here, and they think cowboy hats, and generally most people don't wear them. Certainly the locals don't wear them. Um, yeah, some country artists are known as hat acts, and uh, yeah, we have hat acts. But in the meanwhile, um, you know, Nashville has a very diverse music uh, scene. And um, it's definitely not just country. And it's grown even more diverse uh, since I moved here. I moved here in 1994. But you know what? It was always diverse. Uh, and long before I moved here, it was diverse then. Um, you know, a lot of people may or may not know about Jefferson Street and its long history uh, of having great R&B clubs and blues artists. And, you know, Jimi Hendrix, for one, was uh, somebody that played in the Nashville scene. And there's some few famous clubs, even uh, some locations here still in town where um, he played at. And, you know, it's important to note and know this because if you're considering moving to Nashville um, or you're looking for a place to move to do your music, uh, say you're a guitar player or a bass player and, and you, you, know, you want to go somewhere where it's happening, I can't think of any place else that has more music, more different types of music every night of the week than here in Nashville, Tennessee. Okay, now the most obvious type of gig that there is, and everybody seems to, to know about these days because of the popularity, is the gigs on Lower Broadway in Nashville, Tennessee. Okay, now this is actually the type of gig that I have the least amount of experience doing, uh, but I have done Lower Broadway gigs. And I've done lower Broadway gigs in the country bars, and I've also done lower Broadway gigs playing R&B in the former B.B. Uh, King's Blues Club that was here in town. But the most obvious thing uh, that you can do is play uh, these, you know, honky tonks and you know these star branded uh, venues downtown. And the pay can vary a lot, okay? Um, you know, I, I can remember hearing back in the day, I think even back when I did it, that the base pay was like $35. And, um, you know, it can, it can be, you know, as far as what you make, as far as what you make on Lower Broadway, it can greatly vary from club to club and from the time of year. Uh, you know, there is a slow season, and that is in the winter time. And, um, you know, I've, I've heard people, uh, you know, back in the old days that they would call it the base pay season because all they pretty much made was their base pay, and the base pays were low. I mean, we're talking 25, 35 bucks. You know, I, I've played country road gigs, and, um, you know, I've had a lot of success doing that. Uh, you know, those those plaques on the wall denote that. But, um, you know, as far as, you know, playing the country repertoire that varies downtown, but has, you know, been consistent with, you know, the latest chart songs and the classics and all that, that's not my bag. Uh, you know, I never moved to Nashville to play country music. Okay, let me give you a little context. I moved to Nashville in 1994, and I moved from Los Angeles, California. Now, I'm not a Californian. I'm originally from Virginia, 
And when I was, you know, 18 years old, 18 or 19, I moved out to Los Angeles. And at that time, it was 1986, and the Sunset Strip scene was absolutely crazy. And, um, you know, but after a few years, you know, the Sunset Strip scene died. I don't think I started playing the strip until about 89, 1990. And we didn't know it at that time, but the scene was changing. And soon grunge would take over and basically the Sunset Strip scene was done. So I moved to Nashville and I didn't move because country music was, you know, blowing up the charts, although they did have Garth Brooks at the time and he was really bringing a new style and a new sound to country music. But I moved to Nashville because I had some good friends that that lived here, uh, most notably the Wooten brothers. And if you're familiar with uh, Victor Wooten, one of the greatest bass players of all time, um, if you're familiar with his brother, Reggie, Reggie was a good friend of mine. And, you know, uh, I had pretty much hit the wall in Los Angeles as far as what I could do. And I re started to realize if I stay here, is anything going to change? I'm working a day job. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, b playing a little bit, but not much. And I thought, you know, I don't know if anything's going to really change if I stay here. So I called up Reggie and, um, you know, I said, Hey man, I'm thinking about moving to Nashville. He said, yeah, come on, come on. And, you know, I was very lucky because I literally moved here and he got me on my first gig and I went from playing the Sunset Strip in a hairband, in a funky kind of metal hairband, to playing in a, uh, what you would call a jazz club in downtown Nashville. And Reggie actually slid over and played bass on the gig so that he could get me on a gig with an artist named Michael Fair and his wife at the time, Tabitha Fair. And, um, you know, a little bit part of me was like, oh my God, if these people knew that I had just got done playing the Roxy and the whiskey and, you know, all the wild stuff that was going on there at the time, you know, I don't know that I would have gotten the gig, but I knew, you know, I had played that type of music. I'd studied that type of music at GIT and I'd always had my foot in the R&B blues and all of that, loved that music, loved, you know, different types of music. I wasn't, I wasn't just a, a metal head. I was a, a guitar player that could play a lot of different styles and just got caught up in the Sunset Strip scene. It's what was happening at the time. So I, uh, you know, I moved to Nashville in 1994 and two weeks later, the Northridge quake hit California. And oh boy, was I glad to be in Nashville. Okay, so I got to Nashville and I started, you know, getting into this blues and R&B kind of scene that was, you know, bubbling under the surface. It's always been here. And I'll, I'll be honest, you know, the older, rich, you know, uh, affluent Nashvillians, they don't hire country bands to play their events. They want to hear old school R&B, the classics, Al Green, Otis Redding, um, you know, the list goes on and on and on and classic dance songs by the Commodores and, you know, um, you know, even the Stevie Wonder, you know, lots of Stevie Wonder. And so whenever there would be a corporate event or a wedding or uh, somebody's birthday party, or a house party, or any number of these things, they would hire an R&B band. So there were many times where I would play gigs with Reggie Wooten. I would play uh, gigs with the, you know, a couple of the Wooten brothers. Joe Wooten was a, a great keyboard player, amazing keyboard player. And I did hundreds of gigs with him. And, um, and I also got hooked up with Scat Springs, who was an amazing R&B 
uh, singer in town, just a powerhouse on stage. And Scat was great at talking to people and getting the gigs. So there was a time where just about every weekend I would be out with Scat Springs playing a wedding or playing, you know, a, a party or a corporate event or whatever. And he would rock the house every single time. And man, I still miss that guy. And still to this day, I do lots of R&B gigs. I do party band gigs where we're playing weddings or corporate events. I do uh, R&B gigs. And that's really what I like to do. Um, you know, I can play different types of music. I've done tribute acts. I've done, uh, you know, country road gigs, and I'm going to get into all that. But mainly what I do in town is R&B, party band gigs, and, um, you know, blues and R&B gigs. Okay. Now, as far as those type of gigs and what they pay, the pay can greatly vary depending on who's hiring you and how much they like you. Um, so you get paid anywhere from say $150 a gig to $200 a gig. And I did gigs for years, um, at that rate. And that was what a lot of the scat gigs paid. And eventually he bumped us up to $300 a gig. And we did that for many years. But now when I do those type of gigs around town, it usually starts at 300 and depending on, you know, the budget and, you know, how many pieces are in the band or what you have to do. Maybe you've got to drive an hour outside of town or maybe, um, you know, there's a lot of songs to learn and the budget's high. So, you know, maybe it pays 400, maybe it pays 425 and on the really good gigs, um, it pays 500 bucks a man. So you would make $500. Now it takes a long time to get to that level because, um, you know, somebody new coming in, they're probably not going to pay you that much. But once you establish yourself, you establish your professionalism, you establish the fact that you learn whatever songs need to be learned. Yes, you can make that much money. And, um, man, those gigs are a lot of fun. All right. Now, um, as far as knowing tunes, you're going to have to be able to play everything from uh, real book jazz tunes to, uh, you know, some rock songs, classic rock stuff. And the meat and potatoes will be all your classic R&B, dance, uh, you know, blues, you know, all old school stuff. And some of the new new stuff, like the Beyonce's and the Doja Cat, and uh, you know, a couple of those Bruno Mars type stuff mixed in, and that's the majority of what I do. But now there's the other thing that happened. You know, when Garth Brooks broke into the scene, it changed the music world, and all of a sudden, you know, country became an arena or a stadium act. Now they, they had been playing, you know, stadiums before, but let's be real. You know, I think it was the, really the rock and roll and the hard rock and the heavy metal groups that really perfected playing in arenas, you know, and creating a big sound and a big show. And there came a time where, um, you know, Nashville was changing and the music scene was changing. And, um, you know, the obvious guys that would get the calls for those country road gigs, the guys that did lots of chicken picking and played Telecasters and all that, all of a sudden, I started getting the calls to play with road gigs. Why? Because really what they needed was someone that could play arena rock and arena rock with a twang, right? So my first country road gig was with a band called Trick Pony and they are known for their song Poor Me and that is like it's really like a rockabilly mashup it's got uh, you know a screaming guitar solo and upright bass and 
you know, all this. And so I got called to audition for that group. And I got the audition. And I got the audition because I went in, you know, they liked they liked my look. They uh, I learned the material and, you know, I played it just like the record. And um, they thought, man, okay, this, this guy, this guy fits in. We like the way he looks. Um, he plays good. And, you know, so I got the gig. So I did that gig for probably about a year and a half. And it went through some personnel changes and all that. But on the average, what I made per show, and I think I, they start, they told me they were going to pay me 300 a show. And um, I believe... I ended up getting 250 for the first couple of weeks, like a trial period. And then um, the other thing to talk about with road gigs is per diem. And this is cash money that's handed out at the start of a run. And a run is from the time you get on the bus to the time you get off. So each run, you would get a per day per diem. And this would be, you know, it can vary from gig to gig, but I believe what I was getting at the time was $25 a day. Now, that doesn't seem like a lot of money, but on top of your show pay, you know, when you're out on the road, you don't really need, um, you don't really need money because when you get to the venue, they're gonna have lunch for you, they're gonna provide dinner, and they're gonna also have bus stock which is they provide the bus with whatever the band requests in their rider. Now, they don't always give you everything that's in the rider, but most of the time, yes. So that would include beer. That would include hard liquor. That would include snacks. That would include um, sometimes an after-show meal. So, And that would usually be pizza because you've played a show, you maybe had a couple of beers, maybe a beer while you're doing the gig, maybe a couple celebratory drinks, maybe a lot of celebratory drinks. But that back show pizza can come in handy um, after you've had a few too many drinks and you need to get on the bus and go to bed. So that gives you an idea of what the pay scale was. And, um, you know, that pay scale was kind of consistent on my other road gigs. Um, before I got the Trick Pony call, I got the call to audition for an oldies act or a you know a band from the 60s and i did that gig for a couple couple of years left and came back and did it for probably a couple more years after that and that had a similar pay scale um that was 300 bucks a show and i'm not sure if we if i remember correctly or not whether we got a per diem or not but those would be fly dates now, fly dates are the other type of gig that you have in Nashville, all right? A fly date means you'll take your guitar, you'll take your pedal board and whatever clothes you need for the weekend, and you'll get probably a very early flight, um, sometimes the day of the show, and you'll fly, you know, get there, get up at four in the morning, get to the airport, catch that 6 a.m. flight, fly to your destination, um, they would usually uh, probably check you into your hotel. Sometimes you split rooms, depending on the gig. Sometimes you get your own room. That's something that's negotiable, all right? And then um, at some point, they'll pick you up. They'll take you to sound check. You'll sound check, and maybe if there's time, maybe go back to the hotel to change, or maybe you just stick around, have some food, and, you know... Uh, play your show. Then they take you back to the hotel and that's it. That's a fly gig. And, um, you know, those gigs are still going on now. Um, you know, the two different types of gigs as far as a road gig and a fly gig. Um, at this point in my career, I think I'd be all right with doing fly gigs. Uh, why? Because you're not gone as much. When you get on that bus, you know, that, that drive alone could be 12 hours. It could be 24 hours. It could be a two day road trip if you have to go out West. And that's two days on the bus with 12 or 13 guys. So you have the, you know, things that come up with that. 
But those are the two types of road gigs. And on my uh, fly date gigs, you know, it was the same pay. It was 300 Now, there are other higher level road gigs out there. And, you know, one of my friends uh, that got me a couple of these road gigs, he used to call it the Redneck Lottery. And he called it the Redneck Lottery because there would be, you know, a handful of guys in town that got lucky, got on with an artist early in their career before they blew up and played the gig. The gig blew up and then they were elevated to a higher pay scale, sometimes put on salary, um, you know, and that can vary greatly and there can be rewards, okay? I've heard stories of back in the day of big name artists buying cars for every member of the band or buying motorcycles for everybody in the band. Um, you know, you really, you have to say, you hit the lottery at that point. And um, I don't hear so much of that going on now. Although you do hear about Taylor Swift taking care of people in her crew and, um, you know, bonusing, giving bonus to the drivers and all this kind of thing. So it does exist, but it is rare. And most of the time you'll be working at the industry standard. And I think, you know, in some cases that could be as low as 150 bucks a show, 200 bucks a show on up to 300 bucks a show and anything above that is negotiable. Now you can get a raise and I've, I've gotten raises on the road and been bumped up to 350 a show, or maybe they give you another duty. You become band leader and they bump you up a hundred bucks for that. Or they, um, you know, they ask you to advance the dates for the gig. And if it's a fly gig, advancing the dates means calling the promoter, making sure you have the equipment needed because when you do a fly date, you do not bring any amplifiers. Now this is, I was doing fly dates before modeling uh, became what it is today. So, you know, when I would fly to the venue, I would have two twin reverbs waiting for me. I would have that in the rider. I need two twin reverbs, good quality, working. Okay, and the reason why I would get two, whatever amp I was using, I would always ask for two because there's a good chance that one might have a malfunction and it could have that malfunction during the show. It could have it during sound check, but either way, you have to make sure you can still play your show. And then with modeling, you could throw a modeler in your backpack and run direct. But, you know, back in the day, you would need to have two amps. And there's many times where I'd be playing the show and one of the amps is dying while I'm playing. So what do I do? I would run into both amps at the same time, run stereo. And if one of them's dying, I'll just turn it off and just finish the gig with the other amp. Okay, so you've got road gigs. You've got fly dates. You've got your Broadway gigs. You've got your R&B and your corporate and your weddings and all that. But you've also got the other thing in town, which is harder to get break into. And, um, you know, the pay scale can vary on that. I'm not doing like typical studio sessions. You know, every now and then I'll get a call to play on somebody's thing and, I'll, you know, I'll show up and they'll say, hey, it pays 150 bucks a song or, you know, this is the budget for this. Uh, occasionally I've gotten calls to do whole records and they might say, okay, we're going to pay you 1600 bucks to do this record. All right. And a lot of that will be, you know, off, off the card, meaning it's not a union session. All right. So those pay scales can vary and sometimes they can be really good and sometimes they can just be average. Um, and everything is negotiable here in town. But, you know, when you first start now, you should just take what they offer you and play as many gigs as you can. But the hardest one to break into is studio sessions. And, you know, I will say this. Those guys earn every penny of what they earn. Because playing a Nashville studio session while the chord changes and the songs may seem very simple, you are sometimes tasked with taking a demo that is just maybe a guy scratching out, 
you know, a song on his acoustic guitar, maybe singing out of tune, maybe singing out of time. And you were tasked with, within moments, to turn that into a finished song, a finished master. And you get in there, I don't care what level of player you are, um, if you've never done that before, it can be uh, intimidating and you've got to be able to think quick on your feet, all right? So I can give you a couple of tips on how to do that. But it's a lot harder than recording at home. Now, I do a lot of recording sessions on tracks from air gigs and friends that say, hey, can you put some guitar on this? And, you know, little projects that I'm working on on the side where we fly tracks back and forth. I do a lot of that. And that can also vary in pay. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about uh, Nashville. Now, a Nashville session is hard because you're, you're tasked with, listening to a demo and maybe that demo is so stripped down there's nothing there and you literally have to you have the time from when you walk out of that control room after you've written your number chart and you know coming into that room you have from there to the time you sit down and while they're maybe you know getting ready to hit record you've got that time to think what am i gonna play i've got a page that says one, four, one, four, five, five, one, four, one, four, or one, six, two, five, one, six, two, five, one, six, two, five. I mean, there's no instructions there. Now, depending on the artist, you might have some idea of what you need to play, but you've got to be able to think quickly on your feet. And, you know, you get in that room and you put those headphones on and the drummer's tracking in the other room. You've got your amps put away, you know, in the other room. And you've got to quickly go, man, not only do you have to think about the part, but you've got to think about the sound, all right? So you've got, maybe you've got two amp heads and a, and a 412 cabinet that they've mic'd in another room. And you've got to go, man, is this Marshall? Is this Fender? Is this Vox? What tone do I need to get? And... What pedals on this floor am I going to use to quickly get a great guitar sound? I mean, you've got to make it happen quick, right? You don't have time to putz around. You can't go, oh, wait a minute. I'm trying to get the sound. No, because pretty soon they're going to go, they're going to hit the talk back and they go, everybody ready? All right, let's go. Let's, let's do it. Uh, tempos 88 and begin. And the drummer counts off the tune. And you're expected to turn one four one four one six two four into a song, a finished sounding song like that. Now, the other thing is the drummer's in the room with you, and you've got headphones on, and you've got your headphone mix, and you can dial in. You know, if there's a scratch vocal track, you can dial that in. You can dial in the bass. You can dial in the keyboards. You can turn down what the drums that are coming through your phones. But that drummer's, you know, a few feet away and you can hear him in the room and he's, he's hitting, he's bashing, right? So you've got the phones on and you're trying to get your level while at the same time you're trying to get your sound and you're trying to figure out your part at the exact same time. And it happens like that. You're talking about sink or swim and you know what? It's not easy. I thought it was easy before I went in, but it's not easy when you're in that situation and you've got to swim fast. You cannot sink. You've got to do something. And even if, you know, starting out, first thing you do is what we call diamonds. Diamonds in Nashville is just hitting a chord and letting it ring for four beats. It's that, it's that diamond symbol right and maybe that's maybe that's all you come up with at first but maybe you think maybe it's a slow song maybe diamonds with a little tr nice slow tremolo and just create a vibe and and maybe a couple single notes here and there you know one thing that i thought about is 
you know, I learned a bunch of different styles and I played a lot of different styles. So, you know, even if it's a country song, I might think I'm going to do an R&B type fill thing, or I'm going to do a little single note R&B thing that kind of repeats over the chords. And I'm, the other guitar players playing chords. So I'm going to have to come up. And that's the other thing. You've got to think about what the piano player is playing. you got to think about what the other uh, guitar player is playing. And you got to come up with something else. So a lot of times I will think of a um, you know style. I'll think, oh, this, this song is Stones. I'm going to do a Keith Richards thing. I'm going to do this nasty rhythm guitar. Just... You know, this cool, dirt, semi-dirty kind of thing. Or maybe I'm thinking, I'll call Redneck U2. And I'll get a nice echo sound going. And I'll do a little two-note part that kind of floats through the chords. Or maybe, um, maybe it's, you know, oh, this is just straight up a kind of a chicken picking thing. And so if if you're that type of player, you'll come up with that kind of thing. And you've got to maybe come up with a signature lick at the top of the, the song. Those things often aren't written and they often aren't on the demo. So you're going to have to come up with something really super quick. Now, now I hope this video today has given you some idea of the types of gigs and how much money you can make here playing in Nashville. All right. So um, I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, there are more types of gigs, um, you know, in town. And maybe if you're playing gigs here in Nashville, tell me about your experience playing here. Tell me about the type of gigs that you play in your country or your state. And tell me what kind of money is made there. Because I'm really curious about Vegas. And I'm curious about New York. Because I've never, you know, um, I've played in New York. But I never lived there. And I don't know what kind of work is there. And how much it pays. So in the comments, let me know what type of gigs you do. And we'll have a nice little conversation. I hope this video has been informative. And if you liked it, please hit the subscribe and like button and um, hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of my videos. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you on the next video.